So this question is from a Christian lady. Mm -hmm. She says, as a Christian, I believe that God desires fellowship with us, but that he cannot be present with anything dark or imperfect. Mm -hmm. She takes this belief from 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Which says, this is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Mm -hmm. So in order to have fellowship with us, he must have atonement for man's sin. So in other words, he's, we're all dark, he's light, he can't fellowship with us and he needs some kind of intermediary to ensure fellowship with us. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. We believe that he sent down Jesus to be the sacrifice so that he would be able to abide with us eternally mm -hmm. if we will accept the gift, the free gift he offers us. Which is Jesus' blood sacrifice, the yes. atonement, what they call the atonement sacrifice. I see. It's a free will choice. Under this model, God does not send people to hell and he is not a punishing God. Mm. People who have had near-death experiences have lived to tell of a God that weeps over the lost, lost who end up going to hell, i.e. he feels sad about them going to hell but cannot interfere with anyone's free will. <laughs> Interesting concept of God, yes. <laughs> so if I take all these beliefs away, mm -hmm. how do I know that God loves me? I can't seem to take it any further than... God desires me to have divine love and truth and that I can be at one with him someday. And then I can be at one with him someday. But what's God's reason for this? <laughs> yep. <laughs> Go on, is there more to the question? There is. <laughs> and I, I feel this person is very sincere. Very sincere, I agree. Very sincere. Very sincere. So, and I'm not laughing at the uh, person. I'm more laughing at the reasoning that's occurring within the person to come up with these ideas or concepts, which we'll talk about as we go through. That would be good, yeah. Um, so uh, back to the question, what's God's reason for wanting us to have divine love and divine truth and becoming at one with him? Mm -hmm. It could be love or it could be for the good of mankind and mankind's existence. Mm -hmm. Or it could be many other things. Please let me know what you feel I am missing. Wow. Well, so could we understand the question well? Because for me, <laughs> there's a what, lot what there. What the lady is saying, I'm assuming it's a lady. Yeah, it actually. is a lady. Yeah. Um, so uh, what the lady is saying is that firstly, she believes that God cannot be present with anything that's imperfect. And because mankind is imperfect, that God cannot be present with us without mm -hmm. there being some intermediary. Mm -hmm. And the intermediary that God created was Jesus the sacrifice of atonement so that he could abide with us. So mm -hmm. in other words, God's reliant on the blood of Jesus. So it's not only us humans that are reliant on the blood of Jesus, but God's reliant on the blood of Jesus in order to have a relationship with humans. I see. Okay. And this sacrifice is believed to be a loving sacrifice. It's an expression. God gave his only son as a sacrifice and that proves God's love to us. I it's see. like saying that you have to prove your love to me by sacrificing your daughter or son. Yeah. And then I'll know that you love me. And so that's why in the second part of the question she asks, how do I know that God loves me? If there's no sacrifice, how do I know God loves me? I see. Because if, if, if God hasn't sacrificed his only son in order to prove that he loves me, how do I know God loves me? Mm -hmm. It's almost saying, the question itself is almost saying that to prove that you love somebody... You have to kill your own son. Or at least have some kind of sacrifice. Well, no, he's saying, so, it's saying specifically that you have to kill your own beloved son yeah. to prove how much you love the other person. Yeah, right. Now, that's not very fair for the son, <laughs> for a start, if you think about it logically. But it's basically saying that if I had a son and you want, wanted proof that I loved you, the way I could prove that I loved you was by killing my son for you and then I could prove that I love you. Now, that concept is a pretty flawed concept in terms of love. Mm. It's basically saying that you would expect me to kill my own son in order to prove that I love you. Mm -hmm. Why can't I just love you and my own son and not kill any of you? Yeah. Why can't I do that? Because you won't accept it. So this is about mankind's inability to accept love that isn't based around sacrifice. 
see. Do you see? Yes. It, the question itself is flawed because it assumes that love must, that, that love needs sacrifice in order to be love. Mm -hmm. And that is a very, very flawed concept of love. Yeah. And so this, uh, this is a flawed concept of love that most Christians believe, or many Christians believe, that, that, that proof of somebody loving you is for them to destroy something that they love to prove to you that they love you. Mm -hmm. Now, I would ask, why do you need such terrible proof mm. that somebody loves you? Surely that's a very destructive thing to get proof of. And, and also, if you think about it, Nobody in their right mind would get married and as a proof of their love for their marriage partner kill their only child. Hmm. No one in their right mind would do that. But that's what Christians are suggesting God is doing. Yeah. Which is a pretty damaging concept about God. Yeah. This is why I have to laugh because there are so many damaging concepts about God in this underlying belief system. So there's that belief, but then there's this idea of uh, asking, okay, God desires me to have divine love and truth, but what's God's reason for this? And why couldn't it be just love? Y yeah, <laughs> okay. You, can you see that... how for, for this kind of person, they don't believe love is possible without sacrifice. Mm. That's where they're coming from. I see. And they're basically stating that unless God sacrifices something that he finds precious, that people on earth will not believe that God loves them. Now, that is a very flawed concept about love, mm. if you think about mm. it. So there is many parts to this question that I would like to address. There's probably four or five parts Please to the question. Yep. That is one of the parts that I'll address, like this flawed concept of what is required to demonstrate or prove love. Mm -hmm. Is a terrible, it's a terrible requirement that Christians are placing upon God. They're basically wanting God to sacrifice his only son as proof that God loves them. And yet, if they had their own son and somebody came along and said, look, you prove you love me, kill your son, would they agree? They would tell them to go to hell, <laughs> probably. Well, <laughs> right? isn't there an account of God asking someone to of do course. this in the Bible? This is part of the problem. Is there, there's, there is this account with Isaac in the Bible, with Abram and Isaac, and, uh, and Isaac, you know, requiring the being the sacrifice that God required. So Abraham, according to this story, required uh, God required Abraham to attempt to sacrifice Isaac in order to prove Abraham's obedience to God. Mm. Now, I would suggest to you that any God that requires you to murder your own son is not a very loving God. And this is where the concept of God sacrificing for God came from in the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. So you have to see that it surely is a very unloving concept of God. It, it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a it's a concept of an unloving God is probably the better way to put it, yeah. um, which does not exist, actually. This God does not exist. But it has uh, many humans in the past, uh, way before Abraham's time, believed in this kind of a God. They mm. believed in this wrathful, angry God who demanded sacrifice. And they used to sacrifice their firstborn children and usually virgin women uh, to the gods in order to appease them. And there are even accounts in the uh, pageant messages where you see these spirits who had these belief systems. Now, Abraham came from that same time period, so he had a very similar belief system of God until it changed and he started to realise that, no, God didn't want a sacrifice of my child. And all he did then was sacrifice an animal instead. Mm. So he still thought that God required blood, uh, which if, doesn't make any sense either because God created the blood in that animal. So why would, how would it ever appease God? It already belongs to God. Yeah. And very few people consider that. But this whole concept of sacrifice being proof of love is a very damaging concept to a person's concept of God, but also to a person's concept of love. 
it's, it's, like, it's suggesting that the only way to prove that you love somebody is by sacrificing something that you find precious for them. Mm. And this is a very flawed concept of love. It's very prevalent on the earth, very. but very flawed concept about love. And uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot that we need to say about this. So let's get started. Okay. Firstly, the question in 1 John 1 verse 5, it suggests, of course, the, the suggestion that God cannot have anything to do with darkness. There is no darkness in God. Now, just because there is no darkness in God, it doesn't mean that God can't have anything to do with darkness mm -hmm. in the sense that God can't interact with people in darkness. In the Bible, there are other locations in the Bible that talk about Satan the devil, who we've already discussed does not exist, being in God's company. Now, that would suggest that God can interact with people who are in darkness. So it's not accurate to state that God cannot react, interact with people who are in darkness. Now, this woman is suggesting that in order to fellowship with us, he must have atonement for man's sin. However, in the Bible record in Job, God did not require atonement for Satan's sin. And under the Christian definition, Satan's sin is the worst possible sin that anyone has ever committed. Mm -hmm. And yet God could converse with Satan directly. Mm -hmm. Now, if God can converse with Satan directly, surely God can converse with any other person who's a sinner directly. All right? So it's totally yeah. illogical from the teachings of the Bible itself to believe that God cannot spend time with sinners. Also, if we examine it from another perspective, and that is this. Most Christians believe that Jesus is God. And yet in the Bible, it says quite categorically that Jesus spent time with sinners. Now, if Jesus was God and Jesus spent time with sinners, then it means God can spend time with sinners. <laughs> yeah. And this happened before Jesus gave the sacrifice. So therefore, it didn't need Jesus' sacrifice in order for Jesus, God, to spend time with sinners. So again, it makes no logical sense, this reasoning. So um, if we examine some of the Bible verses that talk about that, in Luke 7, it talks about the woman who was a sinner who washed Jesus' feet. So she touched Jesus. She touched God, according to the Christians. Yeah. And yet that was allowed. And Jesus interacted with this woman right, with freedom and therefore proving that God could interact with people before Jesus atoned, before the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Now, if God could do it before the death of Jesus and God did it after the death of Jesus, then what was the point of the death of Jesus? Well, there was no point. <laughs> the death of Jesus did not create what these people assume, which is the atonement of sin, because, because the reality is, before de Jesus' death, God could reside with badness. God could speak with people who were bad. That didn't mean God was bad. He could just speak with them. Right? And God did speak with them according to the Bible. And then Jesus, when he was on earth before he died, he spoke with people who were bad, which means that there was no need for Jesus to sacrifice himself in order to speak with people, for God to be with people that were bad. Mm -hmm. So the presumption here that she, she says in her question, so in order to have fellowship with us, God must have atonement for man's sin, is incorrect. Mm -hmm. God does not need atonement for man's sin in order to fellowship with sinners. Just because God fellowships with sinners, it doesn't make God a sinner. This is, there's verses in the Bible that state this, interestingly enough, like... Here's one. In Matthew 11, for example, it says in 18 and 19, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. <laughs> so here it's saying, in the Bible itself, that Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Now, if Jesus was God, then God was a friend of tax collectors and sinners, and God did not need Jesus' sacrifice in order to be a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Mm. So basically you're showing that the Christian um, belief system is flawed. If they believe in the atonement and believe in the scripture, they actually contradict each other. Exactly. Mm. They're totally contradictory to each other. Mm -hmm. By believing in one, you contradict the other. Mm -hmm. And so this is where like, I find many contradictions in the Christian belief systems. There are more contradictions in the Christian belief system than there is in the Bible itself. Because if a person actually believes what the Bible says, there would not be as many contradictions. 
that there are more contradictions in the Christian belief system than the Bible itself contains. Now, in John uh, 4, verse 6 and 7, this is what it says. It says that... <clears throat> just get it. John 14. Oh, 14, sorry, that's right. Yeah, looking at the wrong thing. 14, 6 and 7, it says, Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you would know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So what I was saying there, and I did say those words, is that because I was at one with God, every action that I took was the kind of action that my Father would take. Yeah. Everything that I did was the kind of thing my father would do. This was while I was alive. These things were what I would do and what my father would do while I was alive. Now, if I sat down and let my feet be washed by a sinner, I can certainly have association with darkness. Yeah. It doesn't mean that I am dark. It means that I am interacting with a person who may be in different condition. Now, if, that, if we take that verse to be literal, and most Christians do, then that means then that I showed what God was like. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm showing what God was like. In showing what God was like, I was demonstrating that God could interact with sinners just as I could interact with sinners before my death. And you're also correcting, the. you're also saying that um, the Christian belief is that you were God and if you follow that doctrine, then it's demonstrated that you that God can be with sinners. Because my but, actions were I was with, with sinners, yes. <laughs> but you and I know the truth that you weren't God. No. You, but you were at one with God, so you I mirrored was. his feelings and beliefs and So no matter desires, what thing you believe about what my nature or character was. You still uh, spent time with sinners. And, and therefore God could spend time with sinners. Yes. yes. So therefore God did not need any atonement sacrifice in order to spend time with sinners. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm using the logic from the Bible here. Of course, I feel the Bible is flawed. But even using its own logic, God could spend time with sinners before Jesus died. Yes. And if God could do that before Jesus died and God could do that after Jesus died, what was the point of Jesus' death? None, nothing, no, nothing whatsoever. And that is true. The truth is I didn't die for any atonement reason. Yeah. That, that is an underlying truth. Yeah. So according to, so if I am truly God and I spent time with sinners on earth, then it's possible for a person who's in a condition of light to spend time in darkness mm -hmm. without being affected by the darkness. Mm -hmm. And that is true. Mm -hmm. That is a very basic understanding and a very basic truth that we need to understand. We can be surrounded by darkness and still be light and ourselves. Isn't inherent in this question the implication that God is our parent who is perfect, but... It, by implication in the statement, it's saying that the parent, the perfect parent, can somehow be affected or restricted from communing with the imperfect child. Exactly. And, and it's a ludicrous proposition if you think about it. Yeah. Like it's basically saying that a person who is the most powerful person in the universe is restricted by his own laws to interacting with a person who, who has decided to walk away from him. Mm. And it's not true. How can it be true? Now, the reverse could be true. The person who's walked away from God is now restricted from having a relationship with God, but not through any choice of God, yeah. but rather through the choice Their of the choice. individual. Yeah. Very, very different. Very mm. different. You see, it's almost like Christians want to blame God for the sacrifice, the atonement sacrifice. It, it's, it's a very warped concept that, that is not based on any logical discussion whatsoever but also is based upon a lot of very harmful beliefs about God. It's based on a lot of like, very harmful projections towards God. Of, and I'm not saying they harm God, they harm the individual because mm -hmm. they believe God to be this person. When, how could God ever be such a person? If you had almighty power of the universe, who are you restricted from talking to in this universe? The answer is no one. <laughs> No one, no matter what their choices and decision, you can still commune with them. Yeah. Whether they can commune with you is a different matter altogether based on their condition. Yeah. But you would be able to commune with them. God has unlimited and unrestricted power, even with God's laws, and God can commune with any person, whether they're you know, sinner or not a sinner, it doesn't matter. 
God can commune, spend time with us in any state if we're open to such communication, if we're open to such rela- you know, a relationship. No matter what state we're in, we can be open to such relationship and God will engage the relationship. So, you know, also in the Old Testament of the Bible, it's suggested that different people spent time with God. Now, under the Christian belief structure, that would not be possible. Mm. But in the Old Testament, it suggests that people did spend time with God. So, So which is it that's true? Again, the logic is flawed. Sure. So so we need to understand this basic problem with this logic. This concept that God needs an atonement of sin in order to commune with people is a flawed concept based from very, very old concepts about God, of being a punishing, wrathful God, needing sacrifice, in order, needing blood, really, mm-hmm. in order to communicate and to favour humankind. And it's based around fear, huge amounts of fear, in fact, this concept of God. And we would never consider that an individual who sacrifices his own child needed to do so in order to prove his love to us. And yet we do almost demand of God that he sacrifice Jesus, his own beloved child, according to our belief systems, to, in order for us to have a relationship with God. And it's a very flawed mm. concept. And it's flawed on a number of areas. Why, why, does, why did Jesus deserve the sacrifice? Why did he deserve that treatment? He doesn't deserve that treatment. What about him? What about his feelings <laughs> in the matter? Yeah. Now, a lot of people then say, oh, but he was a part of God and all that. But that's not true. But even if he was a part of God, it makes no sense at all. If he was a part of God, then God already had it. Yes. Why does God need to do something that creates a lot of pain when God already had what he was wanting to do? Yeah. Again, it makes no sense whatsoever. Yeah. So the, this flawed concept of the atonement sacrifice, the blood sacrifice, the vicarious sacrifice, causing and allowing a relationship between God and mankind, it, it is so flawed on so many levels, logically and from a loving perspective, that, that it's amazing, I believe, that people can even believe it. Now, interestingly enough, in my own life, in this life, due to some history of my, I did believe it for a period of time. Mm. And I go, wow, how flawed was my concept of love? Once I gave up this concept of love, that love requires sacrifice, I could not accept it after that point. Could not accept it. And I suggest that most Christians will not be able to accept it once they have a different viewpoint of love. So that's the first point I'd like to make. Sure. And if people could receive God's love before Jesus died and people could receive God's love after Jesus died, then it demonstrates that Jesus' death had no change. Now, the reality is people could not receive God's love before Jesus came, not before he died. So before I came to the earth, people could not receive divine love because they didn't know how. They didn't know how to. And in my discovery of how to, they also could be taught how to receive God's love. That's the point of my life. The point of my life was to demonstrate to people how to receive God's love. It was my life, not my death, that was important to a Christian or any person, in fact, who wanted to have a relationship with God. Say it again, baby. It was my life, (laughs) not my death. It was by listening to the truths that I discovered through my life and my demonstrating that truth through my own example that allowed a Christian then to come to the knowledge that they too could have the same relationship with God. Yeah. Not my death. My death created nothing except pain for you and my child, pain for some, a, lot, a lot of my so-called disciples at the time. It created no other benefit except one, and that was that I could demonstrate to my disciples that there was no such thing as death by reappearing to them after I died. Yeah. That's the only benefit that it gave. Yeah. No other benefit was created through my death. Mm. The second part of the question suggests that God needs the sacrifice in order to be eternally abide with people in mirth. So she's, she's saying here, he would be able to abide with us eternally as long as the sacrifice of Jesus was applied. Mm. Now... Um, my suggestion to people is God abides eternally under all conditions. 
whether he is with us is completely dependent upon the exercise of our individual will to, for God to be with us. Nothing else. It's not dependent upon a third party sacrifice. My sacrifice was of no benefit to anybody requiring a relationship with God. My discovery of the divine truth was of immense benefit to everybody who wanted a relationship with God. Mm -hmm. It was the discovery and application of divine truth and then my desire to share that with others through my personal example and my life that caused people to have the possibility of having a relationship with God. Nothing, it had nothing to do with my death, nothing whatsoever. And any person who considers that it did is not being reflective about even the Bible record itself because the Bible record shows that I, a human, had a relationship with God before I died. Yeah. Now, if I could have a relationship with God before I died and I am a human, it means that you as a human also could have a relationship with God before I died. I was encouraging every single person I was teaching at the time to have a relationship with God before I died. And many of us did and have many, that relationship. Many did. Yeah. yeah, many begun the relationship with God before I died. Yeah. I would never have encouraged that. I would have said otherwise. I would have said, wait till I die and then you can have a relationship with God. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the Bible indicates itself that I never said to anybody, wait till I die and then you'll be able to have a relationship with God. Yeah. I said, do what I do while I'm alive and you'll have a relationship with God. And that's very plain in the Bible. So the whole logic of the uh, atonement sacrifice is, is all in, it's, it's very flawed. And I do not understand why Christians hold on to it so dearly. I feel it's very emotional for people. It is very it, emotional. This, this idea of someone giving up their life just for me, as, as this lady expresses in her question, is very emotional for people. They think, wow, what bigger gift could I be given? And what? Well, it's true. Like, yeah. what, like the reality is if I decided through a choice of mine to give up my life so you could live, then that's a wonderful benefit. So emotionally, I can see why peop people feel very open to the, the, yeah. the belief, but God doesn't require such a thing in order for you to have a relationship with God. Now, yeah. now and in fact, my death in, under these circumstances can only occur at the hands of people who are very damaged themselves. But why would anyone want to kill you, let alone kill me in place of you? Yeah. Like it makes no sense for anybody who he actually loves to want to kill anybody. Yeah. So, so my suggestion is the whole concept of sacrificing life comes from humanity's long history of death and fear terrible pain yep. occurring throughout history and then people standing up and dying for the sake of others. Yeah. It comes not from my own actions. Yeah. Right? Now the reality is I did stand up for truth and I died for my standing up for truth. I didn't die for the sake of any person. Yeah. I died because I did not wish to compromise truth in my life. That's why I died. Now, people want to believe that I died for them because they want to have that feeling that, oh, someone loves me so much that they died for me. Yeah. That's the only reason why they want to believe it. Yeah. But, but to attribute this death to God is, is, is ludicrous. In a lot of ways, it's so ludicrous, it, it's, it sort of it can't be... It, it, it's amazing, really, because in a way, it's almost stating that the people who killed me were necessary for God. Yeah. You see, it's almost saying, like, God can't kill himself. So there's this assumption that Jesus is God, too, and God can't kill himself because that would be suicide. So that's not on. Right? Yes. So then someone has to kill him for the sacrifice to occur. Yes. So then Pilate, Herod, and the Roman soldiers all become a part of the sacrifice occurring. So why aren't they all blessed yes. instead of condemned? Saints. Because they should all be saints under this, under this <laughs> yes. construct because they all were a necessary part of Jesus' death. Yeah. Without them, Jesus' death couldn't have occurred. So they should all be accredited <laughs> for the so-called atonement sacrifice as well, if you think about it. Yeah. But it wasn't possible without them. It wasn't possible without them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, and obviously such a concept is ludicrous, right? Yeah. So there's another reason why such a concept is flawed. The, the, the third part of the question suggests that God grieves over the condition of humankind. The questioner states, yeah. 
People who have had near-death experience have lived to tell that God weeps over the lost who end up going to hell. That is, he feels sad about them going to hell but cannot interfere with anyone's will. This whole concept that God is sad is flawed. God is not sad. How could God be sad about a perfect universe that God created operating in a perfect manner because of his perfect laws? Such a concept that God would create his own sadness by creating a whole heap of flawed laws that then God would have to obey himself is crazy, yeah. let alone unreasonable. So, so like, it's not, definitely not true. No one in the spirit world who has had a near-death experience and visited the spirit world has ever seen God cry. Mm. They've seen spirits who claim to be God crying. Yeah. They've seen spirits to be you. who claim to be me crying. Yeah. They've also seen spirits who want to show that God cries, impersonating a crying God, just so the person on earth feels like they're loved because they're cared for and that they're going to cause God pain if they choose something that's out of harmony with God's laws. Mm -hmm. You do not cause God any pain when you choose to do something out of harmony with God's laws. None whatsoever. God smiles at your decision. God realises and has compassion of the fact that you create your own pain, but God does not cry at the decision you willingly make in order to disobey God's laws and principles. Is this another idea of love being shown through sadness and regret? Of course and it is. So... Yeah. Um, Obviously, there's a lot of, and I know that there's accounts in the Bible where you supposedly wept, and people see that as a sign. There's only of your one love time well. that I remember weeping in the first century, and that was when Lazarus was said to be dead, and they had buried my friend alive. Yeah. Now I was pretty sad about that because I was thinking, wow, they don't understand so much about death that they can go and bury my friend, and he's alive. You imagine being bound from head to toe wrapped up so you cannot move and you're alive and you're in that condition for over two days. Yeah. Right? Now, the Bible account that he was smelling was not true. He was not smelling, right? he, but he was constrained in this place being alive right? and in this place where he hadn't died yet. It's like, sort of like a place before the spirit body has left the material body. Yeah. And I knew my friend had been buried alive and... and my sadness was caused by the fact that people would go ahead and bury him alive because they didn't understand death at all. Mm -hmm. And so naturally, I let myself have a cry about that and went and remedied the situation. <laughs> <laughs> sure. And uh, the accounts that he smelled and all those kind of things were not true. They were later embellishments to prove that I somehow had resurrected from the dead, which I did not do because it's impossible. Yeah. And... Um, but they, again, they are things that people feel, you know, a weeping God appeals to their emotional state. Mm -hmm. And God doesn't weep. God's a happy God. If God wept, I don't know what the results would be <laughs> in the universe, but they'd be pretty really? incredibly intense, I would have thought. <laughs> if God wept over sinners, then due to the number of sinners that are on the planet and in the spirit world, God would be weeping a lot yeah. because there are billions of sinners and billions of people on earth and in the spirit world who are directly doing things in disharmony with God's laws and love. Mm. And, and if God was a sad God, imagine how much crying he'd be doing. It's like you having a billion friends and you have to cry about each one of them yeah. or 20 billion friends and have to cry about each one of them. Imagine the immensity of the grief. Yeah. God is not like this at all. Well, and <laughs> as we've discussed in other questions, God's actually designed in, inherent in his laws uh, ways that we're going to come back to love and understand our will anyway, aren't we? So what would be his cause for sadness? Mm. Nothing there is, no, is permanent. There is no cause for sadness because God created a perfect system. You don't, you're not sad about a perfect system that you create. And God is never sad about the beautiful system God created. God looks at it with marvel and thinks, wow, aren't I a fantastic creator? <laughs> God, God, God looks at it and my feelings are that God looks at it and goes, wow, this is a beautiful system that I've made mm -hmm. and, and I would love for the people in this system to come to understand how beautiful it is. 
which the people who develop in love do eventually come to see mm -hmm. how beautiful the system is. It's a remarkable system that God's created. And God would never need to cry about anything that's happening in the system. And God doesn't cry about anything that's happening in the system. And once you become at one with God, you don't cry about anything that's happening in the system either. That's the reality. You, you may have compassion and express compassion through tears and you may have joy and you cry in your joy, but you, you, you don't cry in sadness, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you might have some frustration still even once you're one of God in the sense of seeing how everybody acts and behaves. And when I say frustration, it's not anger or anything. It's just frustration in the sense of, wow, if only everyone could see it differently, yeah. <laughs> then that everything would be different. But, you know, the reality is there is no pain in God. Mm. Pain is, the, is a human creation based upon our fear and our walking away from God. If we believe there is pain in God, we have a very incorrect concept of God. God is not pained by anything that we do, but God wishes and hopes and has compassion for our condition and hopes and wishes that we change, hopes and wishes that we get into a better condition. But also God has created this beautiful universe that we've got no other future other than getting into a better condition. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness for that. So this concept that God is a sad God is a very damaging concept of God. Now, the question had also said that if we take away all these beliefs because they're illogical and unnecessary, as we've discussed, and contradictory, then we're left with the primary question, and that is, how do we know that God loves us? And basically, basically it's a statement that it's impossible to, God, to know God loves us unless God sacrifices for us. That's, that's basically. That's the question as belief system. Yeah, that's the yeah. question as belief system. Yeah. But how do you know someone loves you in an interaction? How do you know? Well, they give love to you and you feel it. Mm -hmm. That's how you know. Yeah. There, there's no other way of knowing. You, you, you receive it and then you receive the expressions of love that they give you. Mm -hmm. And that's how you know. Now, would you view an expression of love if I said, I'm going to show you I love you and then I, then I slaughter my son? Would you see that as an expression of love no. or would you be totally freaked out? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't you be totally freaked out and scared of the yes. person? Wow, if they could do that to their own son and say this is love, what can what? they do to me? Yeah. You'd be pretty scared, wouldn't you? Yeah, definitely. So, and this is what I'm suggesting, is that since God is perfect and God always has his love available to give to a person, he doesn't need to go and slaughter anybody in order to prove his love. He just continues to give his love. And when the person desires to receive it, their heart becomes open and they receive it and then they know. But only then do they know. Mm -hmm. They won't know in any other way. They won't know by some sacrifice. In fact, they'll be freaked out by a sacrifice, just as you would be freaked out if I decided to kill my own son in order to prove I loved you. You'd be very frightened of me after that, I'm very sure. Yeah. Right? And this is why a lot of people are frightened of God. If God can kill his own son in order to prove his love for me, what can he do to me? Yeah. in order to prove his love for somebody else. Yeah. All right. So again, the whole concept is flawed from a love perspective. Now, the love of God can't enter the person unless the person desires the love to enter. The person has to exercise their free will in order for the love to enter. So if you love me and I go, I don't want it, then your love will never enter me or change me or have an effect on me. And it's the same with my relationship with God. If, if, if God wants to love me and I go, I don't want it, I don't want it, stay away from me, then of course God's love cannot enter me and therefore I will not have a loving relationship with God. It's as simple as that. It's my choice. And it's a ve very much the same. The only way that you know whether God loves you is when you're open to receiving love from God and you actually receive it. Mm -hmm. That's the only way you're going to know. And what it tells me, these sacrifice beliefs, it tells me that they've received very little of God's love. Mm. Because if they'd received more of God's love, they'd know that God is not capable of such things. God is not capable of the sacrifice of a beloved son in order to prove love to another beloved son. God's not capable of such a choice. Mm. And as a result, once I've received enough love of God to know that, I would never believe in the belief. 
Is this why some Christians then start to begin to focus on your your life on earth, mm-hmm. rather and and the the idea of the sacrifice seems to be put a bit to the side or the back burner. Yes, in if, terms if, of their if faith. we're honest about it, what we can see is the average Christian would have a huge amount of conundrums with regard to the blood sacrifice principle as being expression of love. Mm. And they feel these conundrums in their soul. And so what they try to do then is they try to avoid the discussion of it. They want to militantly believe it mm-hmm. as because of the emotional reasons that we've previously discussed. But, but, but their own soul doesn't sit well with it. Once they receive some divine love, their own soul does not sit well with the belief. And so what they do then is they try to distance themselves from the belief to an extent and then focus on the love that I demonstrated in my day-to-day life that they could see reflected in the Bible through the first century accounts. Yeah. And what they do then is they try to imitate the love that I had. Now, that, that is certainly a far better uh, direction to take, in my opinion. Yeah. If you imitate the love that I had while I was alive, um, then you would do well in your life. However, if you understand that God's love transformed me to the point where I could love in that way, then you'll find it much easier than a hard job to do. Sure. So many Christians find it very hard to imitate me because they have all these unloving emotions inside of them that keep rearing their heads occasionally. And, and they, it's only by the reception of divine love that these unloving emotions will disappear. Mm-hmm. And if they understood that, they would find love a lot easier to both understand and practice in their day-to-day life. So for these reasons... Um, I feel that you know, the question is like flawed on so many issues yeah. and, and, it, and it shows the, the flaw in the belief system. Does that make sense? Yes. But also it's, um, it comes from a basic understanding that God doesn't really love them until God sacrifices for them mm. and then God loves them. And, and it, it, you, can under, you can see that if we applied such principles to our love for our, you know, for a partner, there'd be children dying everywhere. Yeah, uh, it'd be a terrible world. It'd be a very fear-inspiring world too for all the children, who were constantly having their life threatened, trying to prove, with their parents trying to prove to each other that they love each other. It's a terrible concept if you put it into a practical application on earth. And uh, and I've suggested people who are Christian or not that any time it's a terrible concept to consider for us. It's a much worse concept to consider for God because God is far better than any of us. Mm. God is far more loving than any of us. Mm. So, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, the concepts are very, very flawed. The person in conclusion asks, what am I missing? Well, as I've explained, the person is missing a lot of things. Yeah. They're firstly missing a personal relationship with God because if they had this personal relationship with God that was based on love only they would understand that sacrifice is not necessary for love to exist. So that's one thing they're missing. They're also missing a, an accurate concept of God. They, they believe God to be much worse than God actually is. They believe God to be worse than even the average person on earth in terms of his behaviour. And no wonder they're frightened of God if they believe God to be like this In addition, they're not recognising within themselves, they're missing the emotions that drive them to being attracted to such a belief. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole group of emotions, you know, this idea and concept that if someone sacrifices for me, they prove their love for me. How many times in a day-to-day relationship do they want their husband to sacrifice for them to prove that he loves her instead of want their husband to do what he desires and if he desires to love her, he will show him, he will show her the love that he has, yeah. not through sacrifice, but through demonstration of other things. They demonstrate that these concepts are, that they're trying to understand with their mind even don't exist in their own soul. They also demonstrate they're missing a lack of, they're missing logic. They're missing logical analysis of these Bible verses going, well, if I believe that from that verse and I believe that from that verse, these two are contrary beliefs that I'm believing. How can I marry these two contrary beliefs up and, and make them into a third thing that bo- where both of them are true? Yeah. It's a totally illogical thing to attempt such, a, such an argumentation. And this is one reason why Christians 
rivers resort generally to anger when they're arguing mm. because and and personal attack when they're arguing because their their actual arguments are often flawed with logic and because the logic is flawed they have to now revert to personal attack and condemnation of the individual by telling them they're going to go to hell uh, rather than listening to the particular reasoning that the that a person has so i feel she's missing that as well i feel she's missing also the true definition of love this is what I wanted to ask She's you about. She's missing this yes. big thing. It seems like many people on earth have married this idea of sacrifice, even if they're not Christians. Yes. This idea of sacrifice and love being yeah, synonymous. They've joined them together like, and they're not. And how, how do people move beyond that? Because that's entered them as an emotional belief. They, they see sacrifice um, as a sign of love. Yep. So they don't feel loved if someone's not sacrificing for them. Yep. How many women feel that in a relationship when the man Countless. doesn't sacrifice for them? Oh, I've not loved anymore. And so many of us were told by our parents, you know, I'm sacrificing this for you because I love you. And as children, we learn I should sacrifice my desires for the... And that's it's... the point. The point is we imbibe these teachings about God because we've had, to, we've had them forced upon us by our parents. Mm -hmm. We've had our parents tell us while they're building us, while we're experiencing pain and while they're being violent, that they're being loving. We've had our parents tell us that they're sacrificing their life for us and that's an expression of their love for us. None of it is true. None of it is true. It is, but, it, but it unfortunately colours our beliefs about love. And once our beliefs about love are coloured, we then accept religious beliefs that are also yeah, coloured by the same tainted Love. You know that song? Tainted love. <laughs> <laughs> Tainted love. You know, don't touch me, please. I cannot stand the way. You know, like yeah, yeah. he was saying in this song, there's all these things that love does, that yeah. people, the average person says love does, but he could see it's all tainted. It's all, yeah, it's it's all, wrong. all wrong. And what we need to do in order to get rid of these belief systems inside of ourselves is to actually start to see that these versions of love are tainted. They're not love at all. So we begin to see that with our intellect. We need to see that with our intellect, then grieve the fact that we've been taught it mm. like as, as a condition of love. And is it true that if we connect to our childhood experience where these things were done or we were told these things, if we really we'll connect have, to our feelings of those times... We'll we have a lot of grief. We'll find grief and not yeah. a sense of being loved. No. And so as soon as we do that that opens us up to receiving yeah. a new The truth. average child when it's being smacked and being told that it's being loved doesn't, doesn't feel it's feel being that. loved at the time. Yeah. Like it feels it must believe the parent, but it doesn't feel it's being loved. Yeah. It needs to go back to that time and realise that the building was violent and an assault on, yeah. their, on them, a physical yeah. assault that was very, very damaging to them psychologically and emotionally. Yeah. And once they allow themselves to feel that, they'll grieve that and they'll forgive their parent for their actions and they'll also in the end up with this beautiful result, which is I'll no longer believe that love is sacrifice. Yeah. I'll no longer believe that love is violent. Yeah. I'll no longer believe that love is punishing. And these, this is the underlying problem with what the Bible teaches. It teaches these things because the average person on this planet believes such things. And they are open to believing such things because the average person on this planet has had a parent who has taught them these things. So we need to understand the relationship of belief and how things are created. And it's something that we're going to discuss in mm -hmm. some discussions in the future is this relationship between why a person accepts a certain belief and what emotions in them cause them to accept this belief that's obviously out of harmony of love when you look at it from the point of logic and also from a point of feeling. Yes. Like, you know, any person who feels would sense that if I sacrificed my son to prove that I love you, that I'm not being loving to my son and I'm not being loving to you and I'm freaking the hell out of anybody <laughs> around me, right? The average person would see that. So why don't they see it with God? Because they've been taught this all their life and they taught to come to believe it and they sort of, for some reason, believe that God gets away with things that the average person on earth would find destructive and very damaging. Yeah. And it's not true. God is better than any person on this earth and planet. And I feel with what we've discussed today uh, in these FAQs, if we could come to terms with that one fact, that God is love, 
And God is not angry. God is not punishing. God does not need sacrifice. God does not need you to you know, have some self-flagellation in order to prove that you love God. God feels love for you. And the only reason why you don't feel it is because your heart is not open to feeling it. And if we come to that conclusion, we would look at all the reasons why our heart is not open rather than seeking for a God who is an unloving God. The God that you seek is the person you become. If you seek an unloving God, you are going to become an unloving person and at some point in your future you will need correction. And this is why many Christians pass into the spirit world with a lot of correction needing to occur because they've come to believe in an unloving God and therefore they've become unloving themselves as a result. You see many people of a religious nature on this planet acting violently in order to support their religious faith because they justify their violence by saying their God is violent. Their God is not violent. Mm -hmm. Their God of their own imagination is violent. <laughs> the real God who actually exists is not violent, is always loving, is always compassionate, always kind, always merciful, always understanding, always forgiving, always loving. And they need to come to accept that if they're truly ever going to have a relationship with God. Thank you. Pleasure. <laughs>